This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another conversation about what is going on in the property market. As we have all seen, there's been a lot of ups and downs in recent times. And to get some perspective and some clarity on what's going on in markets across the country, it is an absolute pleasure to be chatting with the head of research at LJ Hooker Group, Matthew Tiller. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Grace. So it's great to be here. Matt, I always love getting your insights because it as I just mentioned, is quite a helicopter view of what's going on. And and not only are we going to pick your brains a little bit about what we're just seeing in the property market at the moment, but I know that there's a report um, that you put out very recently around rental markets across the country. So we'll get to that in just a little while. But before we do, um, winter is meant to be quite a quiet period for property, but this year has absolutely not been the case. What are you seeing from your position just with respect to what we've seen with the RBA and and all this talk around the economy lately? Yeah, I don't know if it's ever a quiet period in uh, real estate, is it, Grace? Uh, No. Definitely not at the moment, no. Uh, A lot of interest, obviously, about housing at the moment. We know, you know, there's obviously headlines of housing crisis, rental crisis. We're talking about inflation going rampant. You know, mortgage cliffs and, and, and all this talk. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of positivity in the market at the moment. We know prices have been growing for, well, a few months now, probably about five or six months now. We know auction clearance rates are strong and, uh, and, you know, and, and, buy, and buyers inquiry has been picking up as well. Um, so, you know, we're, we're actually seeing a lot of activity out there in the market at the moment. And there has been some more buyer confidence come into the market now that the RBA has paused for for two consecutive months. And off the back of that, we're also seeing uh, a lot of vendor inquiry coming back into the market as well. So listings have started to rise and and definitely our appraisal numbers and inquiry from vendors have really picked up. Uh, particularly over the past month, uh, with a lot of our agents doing a lot of more more appraisals, getting in the living room a, a lot more, and producing a lot more reports for homeowners to give them an, an understanding of what their home's worth in the current market. So uh, there is a lot of activity, um, and and like I said, there is a bit of positivity out there. I'm going to be using the wrong phrase here, but it does feel I know I. I mean, very wrong phrase because we just talked about how there's never a quiet time in property. But I always feel like we're in that quiet before the storm of where we're just about to hit a a period of real hype and crazy activity in the property market, given what we've seen with the RBA and and the pause that they've had. Do you think we're going to see, as soon as there is that certainty around the RBA's next move, a lot of people actually making a move in the market? Yes, I think there's going to be the activity will come from both sides, being that we've had a period of really low supply. You know, listings have been really tight over the past, well, probably 18 months now. I mean, if you think back to last spring, we really didn't get a lift in listings for spring. There was no, uh, no buyer inquiry. There was no vendor inquiry. Uh, agents were hitting the phones, but uh, with no luck. Really, so there's been a bit of a, a a quiet period for the market, and that has slowly grown over the course of this year. And like I said, appraisal numbers are up, listing activity is definitely up, and I think once we get to that period where the RBA holds for a couple more months, uh, you know, that kind of buyer activity will really start to ramp up, and it'll be perfect time really for buyer uh, activity to ramp up because we're seeing listings rise. So as listings rise, there's more choice out there for buyers. More buyers will be, um, you know, be able to get into the home that they want. The risk of going a little bit sideways here, Matt, where do you see, what would you describe the current market as given that I don't feel like we've had normal for a very long time? Is there any such thing as normal anymore? How would you kind of, how are you expecting this to play out? And what would you call the kind of market that we will be entering? I don't know, colloquially. <laughs> well, we're probably in, in a rising phase of the market at the moment, and it's probably a bit abnormal 
because, you know, during winter, it's, it's usually quiet. And we have to remember we're still, what, we're in August. So we're technically, uh, that's still winter, isn't it? So yeah. I mean, it's cold yeah. outside. That, that's right. Yeah. So, so it's probably still a bit abnormal because, you know, we really, this is the period where, you know, agents are on holiday and sort of starting to build, coming back and building their pipeline for spring. So at the moment, agents are building pipeline and listing, listings are rising and activities rising. So we're probably really in an early spring season. So yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely not back to normal, but what is post COVID? No, exactly. We're going to take a quick break there, but we'll be back in just a moment with more from the Head of Research at LJ Hooker Group, Matthew Tiller. Crush the burden of rising mortgage repayments. We understand that managing your finances can be overwhelming, especially as interest rates continue to rise. With access to 70 plus lenders, our team of specialised brokers will find the best rates for your specific needs. Count on us to secure a lower rate swiftly, giving you the confidence you deserve. Book an appointment with one of our experts today to protect your financial well-being and secure your future. Call us now at 02 or visit our website at finney.com.au. Welcome back to this very special conversation with the Head of Research at LJ Hooker Group, Matthew Tiller. Matthew, it's so great to grab your insights just to get them generally around what the property market is doing before the break. But what I really wanted to talk to you today about is what is happening in rental markets. And I know that this is a report that you guys have pushed out and there's some very fascinating insights in there. And we're probably recording this at the worst time, just as a disclaimer to everyone listening. National Cabinet is in session at the moment with with the rental crisis, a very big topic up for discussion in there and, and hopefully a bit more of a plan moving forward. We'll come out of today's talks, but we're obviously operating under the proviso that we don't know what some of those conversations will be. So just that disclaimer, putting that in there, but still very, very important and relevant to the discussion because in this report, Matt, you had looked at some of the potential solutions for the rental crisis that we are seeing in Australia. But let's take it back a step before that to, I guess, the definition of a rental crisis and what you're seeing across the country. Yeah, I think... We have to sort of almost take a step back and go back and have a look at what happened, you know, during COVID because it really sort of does flow through to where the current state of the rental market at the moment. So if we think back to, to 2020 when COVID hit, you know, we almost had the opposite of what we have at, have at the moment in terms of the rental market. So we had, uh, obviously we had non-residents or you know, those international students or, or the foreign workers, they left the country. We had those young singles that couldn't attend university or maybe they worked in hospitality or some retail sectors moved back home. So we had really, we had a falling rental demand, which meant rental vacancy rates increase and rents actually declined, you know, in, in some areas, uh, you know, by double digits, particularly in the inner city, Sydney and, and Melbourne markets. So we had this real period where rental markets were very soft. Now, fast forward to now, or probably, you know, say start of last year and where everything sort of turned back on the international tap began to flow again in terms of population movement and those international students started to arrive, the, the, the foreign, um, you know, non-residents or working holiday makers or those that had visas to work here started to, to come back into the country as well. And those sort of those that were working from home also wanted a bit more space. So they moved out of home or they moved out their, their group, you know, group housing or share housing and wanted their own space. So there was a real increase in this rental demand. And obviously that's where, where we are at the moment. We're still in a period of very strong rental demand. Vacancy rates are still very tight, depending on who you listen to. It's, it's still below 2%. So it's still very tight right across the country. The rental growth has started to slow down a little bit, but still, you know, it's still still growing fairly strongly at the moment. You mentioned those inner city markets as being the, the worst hit during COVID. As a result now, are we seeing those are the areas that are still really holding the most pain for people at the moment when it comes to finding a rental? Yeah, so obviously 
In terms of the international arrivals, they generally come into our two largest capital cities, being Sydney and Melbourne. And those inner city markets, which saw the most pain during COVID, have actually reversed and uh, seen the most strength, I suppose, the most demand. So they've seen the, the highest growth in rents and obviously the lowest vacancy rates in there as well. Mm. It's felt like it's been a situation that has rapidly become, I mean, it was always an issue, but that change, that flip back to the other way has been so pronounced and so sudden. Have we ever seen anything like this before or is it kind of uncharted territory for, for Australia as a whole? Uh, I mean, vacancy rates definitely have been this low before, but I think it's just the sheer volume of new arrivals into Australia. I mean, if we look back at what the federal budget said this year back in May, you know, the expectation is for FY23, which is just gone, you know, around 400,000 net new arrivals to Australia and the four estimates for the budget are for about 1 million new net arrivals to Australia over the next four years. So there is still this expectation that the population is going to grow strongly over, you know, the next few years. And, you know, really what's required is the increase in supply to match that population growth. Mm. And I think, I guess it comes back to supply as the issue, which then conflicts with the fact that we're hearing so much chat around rent caps and rent freezes. And that's something that you did talk about in this report. Where do you stand on that issue? We've obviously seen the federal government categorically insist that, you know, there is no place for them to even make any judgments on this. It would take it back to a state issue, which I guess then could see, you know, divisive chatter in itself. And that's what the National Cabinet is sort of trying to reconcile at the moment as well. But is there a place at all for rent caps or rent freezes, in your opinion? Look, I don't think those kind of interventions into the market really work. They tend to have the opposite effect. And really what's required is an increase in supply. So the solutions from the government should really be looking at how they increase rental supply, not how they cap or kneecap those that currently supply the market at the moment being, you know, your private mum and dad investors. Mum and dad investors, you know, they typically make up, you know, more than 95% of the rental market here in Australia. So why would they want to kneecap that supply when there's a supply issue at the moment? I mean, I've CoreLogic recently uh, released a great sort of analysis of the sort of investor market and They're seen particularly in terms of the new sale listings at the moment. There has been a rise from investors listing their property because simply they can't keep up with the mortgage repayments. And so even through this period of strong rental growth, the mortgage repayments for some investors have surpassed that growth in rents. So the report showed that typically, you know, on average across the country, rents are up about $221 over the past 12 months, but mortgage repayments on the similar property were up almost $800. And in Sydney, yeah, there's an even bigger disparity. So rents in Sydney on average up $350 a month, where the mortgage repayment on that same property would be a $1,250. So, you know, there's a big disparity between, you know, the mortgage repayments uh, for an investor and the, the rental income that they're getting at the moment. So obviously some investors can hold on. Some investors don't have such a large mortgage on their investment properties, but a lot of investors are feeling the pinch already at the moment. And that's without any rent caps or, or rent freezes. Where do we go to from here, Matt? I understand that is a huge question to be posing to you right now, but I can't foresee, you know, we've seen those changes in mortgage repayments and rental increases over the last 12 month period, but I can't see that reversing over the same period, no matter what, you know, could be put in place. So what does that environment and landscape look like moving forward and and what can be done? What are you proposing be done? Yeah, look, I think, you know, the government needs to look at more innovative solutions than simply capping rents. You know, we're talking about a housing crisis in general. And from a rental perspective, what's really needed is to get more, like we said, more supply. It's all about supply, whether it's, you know, for rent or for sale. 
the government needs to be encouraging the building of, of more homes right across the country, capital cities and regional markets. So, you know, there needs to be a bit more innovative solutions and they are out there uh, for the governments to look at. I mean, in New South Wales, I know there's a few reports are looking at, looking at a kind of at Landcom, you know, it's a, a state agency that looks at the land in New South Wales and, and for them to become developers or to not sell off land to private developers and to build themselves. You know, defence housing is a great model for the government to look at that supply rental housing and rental accommodation and encourage private investors to contribute to their pool of housing as well. Uh, you know, they provide rental stock for the defence force. So, that's one area in which the government could roll out a similar model for, you know, our essential workers or for social and affordable housing requirements across the country. Mm-hmm. Don't go away. We're going to come back just after the break with more from Matthew Tiller. Welcome back to this conversation with the Head of Research at LJ Hooker Group, Matthew Tiller. Matthew, it has been so great to chat with you so far around what we're seeing in the rental market and very timely given what's going on with the National Cabinet and then the broader property market as a whole. But one thing I want to pick up on from the last segment was around incentives and how we can be better incentivizing, I think, the private sector, the mum and dad investors, those people out there to be providing, I guess, longer term accommodation solutions and how the government can really get behind private investors to, to really ensure, you know, that, that ground is kept underneath Australia's accommodation and an ability to provide accommodation. So longer term leases is something that you have brought up in the report. And I thought that was quite an interesting one because it, it makes so much sense. And from my perspective, doesn't really require many levers to be pulled for it to be enacted. Yeah, I think, I mean, from my point of view, I've worked in the commercial property market uh, as well as the residential property market. So I think it's interesting the, the difference between, you know, a commercial lease and a residential lease. And so I think some of the things that work in commercial leases can actually be a benefit to both landlords and tenants, uh, you know, in residential markets as well. I mean, when we think of some of the, the gripes, I suppose, of tenants in, in residential, you know, not, not being out of hang pictures on walls and some of those things and, and, and the insecurity, um, around, you know, six or 12 month leases. I think they can be solved by looking at a commercial lease model where, you know, you sign up to a commercial lease, you know, you have a make good clause, you know, which means that you return the property to its original state that you had on your first inspection. So whether, uh, you know, a tenant puts up uh, a picture, has a hole in the wall, whatever they do to that property, obviously they need to get the owner's permission. But once they have the owner's permission that they can make these changes to the property, they then return it to, you know, the original state. You know, the second thing is long-term leases, you know, five, 10-year leases obviously are quite common in the commercial space. And each of those years, it actually has, you know, they have rent increases built into those leases as well. So it's surety for, you know, the the landlord that they're going to get an increase on their investment each year, but also that that security for tenants that they do have, you know, a lease in place for the next five, 10 years that they can call home. It's really good food for thought and doesn't seem to actually even need any government or council intervention really to get it off the ground. But I think it's a great thing for people listening to this episode to think about, you know, maybe I do look at, you know, longer term leases or how can I ensure that my property is what people are wanting? And property managers have a real big role to play here too, I feel like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I'm not, you know, from a, a legal perspective, there's obviously legal requirements that would need to be put in place to have a commercial style lease in residential. I mean, obviously, things like non, uh, no cause evictions. Yes. Yeah, so obviously, uh, you know, sort of legislation around that, which has been discussed at state levels you know, would probably need to be enacted. And, you know, there's a lot of obviously legal hurdles that may need to be overcome to get that. But, you know, it's just, I suppose, when we're talking about the innovative approach or, you know, a, a different way of thinking, all these things need to be thrown into the ring, discussed, and, you know, and this is where, where how solutions come out and to fix crises. It's about putting all, all the ideas into 
the discussion and getting consultation from, you know, everyone, tenants, landlords, property managers, everyone that, that is in this space and seeing what comes out and what can really move the needle to fix this crisis. For sure. And I love the stress that you've put on innovation as being needed. Clearly, what's happening at the moment isn't working. So some fresh thinking won't go astray here. Um, Matt, before I let you go, I do have to ask as well, given your work as a researcher and, and your helicopter view of the markets, to use that phrase again, what you're seeing now that we've come out of COVID and we obviously saw a lot of flux when it came to migration patterns during that time. And I'm curious where you're seeing it go now. You know, it's probably something that we haven't really touched upon in the last little while, but we did see so many people leaving the big cities for greener pastures, a bit more space and heading to regional hubs as well. But is that a trend that is continuing? Because people did think that that was going to be cognizant of a far longer term shift of of ways of living. Yeah, the movement to regional areas from capital cities is definitely still a thing that's happened. And it's, it's a thing that, you know, has, has happened for a long time, even uh, before COVID. Obviously, COVID really supercharged uh, and turbocharged that movement from those looking for a lifestyle change, looking for to escape the city, to escape the crowds, you know, particularly during a pandemic. So it's still occurring, but just not at the pace that we saw during COVID. But what's also happening is we are actually seeing that kind of that slowdown from city to regional areas, but we're also seeing a movement now from regional areas back into to capital cities as well. So when we look at it from a net perspective, those moving out and those moving back in, it's probably it's probably more people moving back to capital cities than there are those moving to regional areas. Okay. So that kind of population growth into regional areas is still happening, definitely still happening, but just not as much as what we saw during COVID and probably back towards uh, you know normal or, or more average levels. Hmm. I wonder how much of that can be attributed to the mandating of office days and and the like again. And- like, is that something that you're seeing or, or do you think it's more about more job availability? So it, we have also seen a very interesting economy when it comes to jobs and full-time workers at the moment. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, employment markets are still very tight at the moment. I mean, anything under sort of 4% unemployment rate is considered very tight. So, you know, employees still have the upper hand when negotiating, you know, their conditions of work and, you know, And if they do feel that it's time to leave, then they're pretty confident that they can find another job at the moment. Obviously, this is expected to to soften over the course of the next sort of 12 to 18 months. You know, the RBA has already said that, you know, for inflation to come down and uh, for interest rates to remain stable, uh, you know, unemployment needs to rise. So there is an expectation that employment markets will soften and potentially, you know, that will see more more of this movement back into capital cities where, you know, that job availability is obviously a lot more than there is in regional markets. And at that same time, you know, those larger employers that do hold a lot of office space, that do lease a lot of office space, will require, you know, employees to come back more days into the office. I don't think, um, you know, the work from home trend is is something that's going to be around for a long time. I don't think we'll ever see, you know, that kind of five day, five days in the office uh, sort of come back into into full swing. But I do think there will be an expectation from employers that, um, you know, workers do pick up a couple more days back in the office, you know, and that that will start to slowly rise over the next couple of years. Well. A very interesting time for property at the moment, as we prefaced at the beginning of this episode. Matt, thank you so much for sharing your insights and just shedding some light on what's going on at the moment. It's been great. Great to chat with you again. Uh, anytime. Thanks, Grace. Thank, uh, really appreciate uh, you having me on today. To everyone who is listening along from home, the car, the gym, wherever you are, we hope you have enjoyed this episode. Like or review us on whatever platform that you do listen to your podcasts on. If you have any questions, reach out editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Check us out on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, 
and our brand new YouTube channel if you haven't already. Until next episode, stay safe and well wherever you're listening from. Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.